how long did it take to join the SAS? Well, it's a six month process and I'm lucky because my last two years spent in the regiment after spending 10, I was a, an instructor running um, SAS selection. So I've seen selection from both sides of the fence. Um, like I say, it's a six month process. It's broken down into segments and it's nothing like that shite that's on TV. I can tell you now. During that six six months process, you'll never get an instructor scream at you, shout at you, or try to motivate you. Um, the first phase is what they call the hills phase. This is where we take the soldiers up as individuals onto the Brecon beacons, and um, they're, they're set marches, like walks. They get longer. The, the weight they're carrying gets heavier, but they're always by themselves, and there's loads of different routes, so they can't follow one another. So after that period, there's test week, which is a set of uh, set marches ending in a 65k march called long drag. Um, the successful guys after that have proven that they can push themselves under arduous conditions. The next thing is we then take them to the jungle for five to six weeks. But this time we put them into patrols and we're looking at them as are they a team player? Can they mix with five other strangers and come to this unit? And this, as an instructor, this is where you start seeing to guys' souls because the jungle is actually harder than the hills phase because it's a hostile environment. As soon as you get under the canopy, it's a, it's a, uh, a primary jungle. It's hot. You're either walking up, uphill or downhill. You, you're all soaking, whether it's crossing rivers or just sweating. Um, you're carrying heavy loads, you're under a lot of pressure and everything in there wants to either bury its head into you, bite you or scratch you. Um, so a lot of guys get in there and they become claustrophobic and they can't think about the tasks at hand. They just see this green curtain in front of them. So you could be here, it just looks exactly the same. You walk all day and you get maybe four or five Ks over there. You're knackered and it looks exactly the same. And everything is twice as hard in the jungle. You have to be very careful with your own personal admin. If you don't look at yourself, look after yourself, your body starts falling to pieces. So during that period, we've only probably gone into the jungle with 45 guys and we started on the hills with 200. You know, half of these half of these guys are going to stick their hand up and say it's not for not for me. Some of them that don't, you know, they're not going to pass. So you know, you're always making notes. And I used to be fair as an instructor in, the, in under the trees. If I had an, a certain individual and I wasn't sure, what I would do is get him moved into another patrol so somebody else could look at him just to make sure it wasn't a personality, um, you know, problem because. We all have friends or we all know people, but you don't like them. And there's, you you know, for no reason. And you just think, mm, I'll, I'll just check, double check on this kid. The next phase after that is um, combat survival. Again, we get the guys and we teach them all the things they need to know in terms of survival and how to conduct conduct themselves after capture. That's resistance to interrogation and various things. Next phase after that is um, continuation training. So this is where now we've got to teach soldiers who are used to carrying a weapon in a uniform how to carry a weapon in civvy clothes and then, say, walk in your neighbourhood or my neighbourhood and not stand out, how to blend in and to be a grey man whilst, you know, they're on the radio, they're following somebody. Um, and that came from, say, like a Northern Ireland type of scenario. Um, now they do other scenarios that are, are more fitting, like alert working in London, maybe following a terrorist cell to know that they've got to get in close to, you know, put one into their head. Um, other technical equipment now, listening devices, drones, other various, other various kit. So at, at the end, you know, it's six months and uh, you're usually left with anything from five to 12 guys. And uh, they're then sent off to one of the four squadrons. And basically, you're, you're the new guy in the squadron. But you have to be capable enough to fit in, as in you know what the score is. Um, a good friend of my brother's, he passed into the regiment. And uh, B Squadron was up in Afghanistan, but up, up country. And this lad, uh, he was flown out. Um, to join the squadron, but he was at Basra. Then he had a, a, a two-day road journey to get 
to the squadron and he had a bunch of Afghan soldiers. Well, on the first day, he was ambushed and he was in an ambush for two days conducting like this operation where he's having to call in fast air to, to drop ordnance, bring in other troops to, to orchestrate this whole attack. So the guys have to be top-notch once they pass selection. Do you know, see when you're giving them the course and putting them through their paces, do you know from day one who, who's got a good chance of passing? In the jungle, I know within, I would say, a week of how they conduct themselves. And, and there's a couple of little tests I would do with them that I wouldn't, you know, it's not rocket science. There's an exercise. The bit hardest thing in the jungle is navigating to know where you are because you can't see nothing. So everything's done by pacing and it's ridge lines and um, river junctions and things like that. So there's a certain skill to it. So what I would do is take the guys out and we'd do it tactically. So we're moving slowly, you know, everybody getting into fire position, stuff like that, get into a lying up position and they run through all the drills. And then I would say, right, fellas, tomorrow we're going to just do some semi tack stuff. Um, and I will give you start giving you tips and stuff like that. But I, but I want you up at three o'clock in the morning on the track. Now, when you're in the jungle and the, and, the, and the light goes down, it's like being locked in a room without any windows and somebody puts a blanket over your head. Now, the guys have to then put the hammock up. They have to put the poncho up. They have to sort the food out and everything else. So that means they're emptying their rucksack and various other things. So get, get them up at three o'clock, pitch black, pack the kit, get them on the track. I would walk them for about 200 meters, then just stop them and say, right, use lots, sit down, get yourself a brew on, get something to eat. And then I'd walk down to the basher site. So this used to crack me up. You get to see one basher site, so you find a pair of socks. You get over here, you find some paper, you find something else, you'll find a bit of equipment, you'll find maybe a, ma like a, a, a rifle magazine. So then I go back and I'm like, whose is this? You know, the same. So there's a lot of bollockings. And then it's like you then get to see how a guy takes a bollocking because nobody likes being told, you know, that they're an idiot and that their, their shit's not together. And it's how they affect them and whether they can get over it. But then you look at their attitude, at the way they start looking at you. And then the other thing that I forgot to say as well, what I do is when I get them in to that LUP point, I will just say I'm going back to base for an hour and I'll be back. Now, that patrol are supposed to work together. And that means if you're the radio operator, you've got to set up your radio, get your antenna out, and, and then con like write a message out and stuff like that. So what should be happening is you're, you, one of the lads on the patrol should be coming to you, asking you to give, give you his hammock and his poncho, so as you're working on the radio, he's putting your bedding up. Another guy should be coming in saying, give us your scoff and we'll eat together. So he's cooking tea as you're sending that message. So the patrol's working. But you can all, I guarantee you'll always get one guy who will slope off and he just gets his hammock up, gets his scoff on, and he thinks he's in bed now for an extra hour's kip because he's just looked after himself. Then as soon as I identify that person, when you watch them, as a patrol working, he'll always stand out like a dog, you know, like a dog's bollock, and you know he's not working with it. And the more you watch, the more things you see, and then at the end, you know, you're making notes and stuff like that. And during the period of time, they'll come up to you and they'll just say, you know, I'm going to rap. The funniest one was we went out on a three-day. Um, it was actually a three-day turnaround, Navex. So we walked for three days just directly out into the middle of the jungle. And I could see this kid, he was going to rap. And uh, sure enough, at the end of the day, he came up and he went, uh, Staff, uh, I've had enough. And I went, just sit over there and take five minutes. I'll give you five minutes to think about it. And uh, he came back, he went, no, I want to rap. I went, okay, break your weapon, unload your weapon and uh, break it up. Because this fucker now, he's got a, a live roundup, the spout, like, you know, and he could get pissed off with me. So just say, break your weapon down, pack it up in your bag. And then he said, oh, well, what happens now? I, went, well, what? I said, you're, you're off. And he went, well, how am I getting back? And I went, the same way you got here, mate, you're going to walk. And then it, he realized, and it's happened a couple of times, they realized then they'd walked out thinking they're going to rap, but never thinking, I'll still have to walk back. So if he kept his mouth shut and just walked back, he would have still been in. You know, so 
from a mental point of view, you see guys make some really stupid decisions, especially when they're exhausted and tired. And they think a, a spider's around the corner or snakes around the corner. So the jungle is a great place to be. I love it because w as soon as I get in the jungle, I know I can step two meters away from you and you wouldn't be able to see me. And I can hide. And, and when you consider my escape and evasion was on a flat fucking desert floor, flat as this thing where there was no fucking hiding... The jungle to me is heaven. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit <laughs> if I've got trees. I don't give a monkeys if I've got um, ticks on me, bites, leeches, whatever. They can chew away as much as they want. I know I'm safe. Um, whereas in the desert, there's no way to hide. Is that where a lot of people break in the jungle? Yeah. Is yeah. that the main? Yeah. When you consider these guys are the fittest from the course because they've passed the first phase, they get in the jungle and they just wrap and they let themselves and it shows mental weakness that they're you know they're not focused and you know so, and, and they're all shapes and sizes you know you can't just say mm, he's a big lad like yourself he's a big unit he'll be fine it's all shapes and sizes now another one and on my selection which was unusual uh, during the resistance to interrogation now you've had a hard week on the run no food and living in just your clothes piss wet through and sometimes it's all around Scotland and further down uh, to Northumberland. So you're, you're knackered. And then you go into a, a, a resistance to interrogation for 30, 36 hours. And you get in, you get to, it's, it's very realistic. You are, you're subjected to sleep deprivation, which really screws your mind up. But you're interviewed by different people. Um, you'll usually get a guy who looks decent. He'll ask you nice questions and he'll say, if you sign this piece of paper, I'll give you this bar of chocolate. You'll get a right nasty looking guy who's going to threaten you. You know, he's going to knock your head in. You'll get an old guy who will just keep asking you the same question. And he, it's a false, he puts you in a false sense of security because you think he's a dithering old guy. And then you get a woman. And I'll tell you what, you go into a room as big as this table and behind you and the woman's there there's two guards behind you and there's cameras and what it is is all the other interrogators are watching your reaction and she's listening to them and they do an analysis on you so first thing she does is uh, get your overalls off so you're freezing cold so your dick's disappeared <laughs> and she laughs like that she's like that you call that a cock you know is that what's that what, what are you going to do with that well I mean to me I'm just like just blank it, zone it out, and you're there because you can't talk. Can't you? You can only say your name, rank, and number. That's it. And I'm thinking they can punch the shit out of me because they can't kill me because it's an exercise. But your head starts to get twisted, and these guys are in foreign uniforms and stuff. And you're thinking, is this real? And you start questioning yourself. Well, these lads. One lad, he was a big old paratrooper, being down south. He launched himself over the table to knock this bird's head in. And obviously the, the guards pulled him down. He was off selection. And he'd done all the work on the hills, done all the work in the jungle. And then another guy did it. And she had seven guys crack under an interrogation. And it's, it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a mental state. And it's, it's hard to t tell you. I mean, if you, if you were doing some psychedelic, you know there isn't uh, like say gnomes running around the floor, but they're there. That's like not being on drugs, but it's like being on drugs because you haven't slept for maybe three or four days. And then they, when, you're in the, when you're in the bag, in the pen, you're in stress positions, being subject to white noise, and it really like screws your head um, in a big way. And that's the easiest way to interrogate anybody is, first of all, keep them up for a week. And then they'll start seeing things, they'll hear voices, and then you throw a bit of waterboard in, and they'll be fucking singing like a, a budgie. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but I, I used to watch the, I don't know what film it was, but they used to, I think they used to put the soldiers under the water, but it used to just tap on the top of their head, like drip. drip. Yeah, it's just and to make you... Yeah, just used to lose their shit. Yeah, you, you can, it's making anybody uncomfortable. Because the white noise, it's, it's a like non-evasive in terms of, it's not being hit with a stick. Because the good thing is, somebody's hitting, hitting you with a stick, and I'm sure you've had a fair few beatings, when they're hitting you, you grit your teeth and say, go on, you bastard, you know, and it, it, it gets your adrenaline up, it gets everything up, and you, you're getting ready to go back when nobody's touching you and your, your back's breaking, your arms are breaking, or you're in a, a sitting position with your hands on your head, and then somebody's pouring water over you 
just to make you cold and you're freezing and that it it just it it wears you away so that's the mental torture yeah, of yeah. it not the physical yeah and it's it's you're kept in a room under their control all i did was 36 hours you know i know it's 36 hours you don't know how far in you are how far you know you've got to, to go in fact you're that screwed before you go in on the exercise because it's a week on the run and being chased by say infantry units with dog teams so you might have had about three or four beatings during that period um they said you, you when you finish um it'll be the sergeant major of training wing he'll have a white armband on and he'll he'll get you out the room and sure enough this guy don came and he went jordy uh, that's it i didn't believe him i'm like this is a fucking trick and I sat outside on the floor and he said, are you all right yet? And I was like, wouldn't speak to him. And it took me about three hours until other guys were coming out of the pen and we're all sat together because you're that aware that this could be a setup, but it wasn't, you know, but that's how much it I screws your head. Guys.